What up, party people? Welcome back to the most negative channel on the planet. I am your boy, BQ, with another TNA mailbag here on the channel. If you are an Impact Wrestling fan and you like a honest opinion on the product, man, I'm still to this day calling Impact Wrestling. Um, if you're a TNA fan, you like an honest opinion on the product, on, on what's good, what's bad, this is the place to be. So hit that subscribe button. And of course, when I do these mailbags, uh, you know, I want to know your guys' thoughts to the same exact questions in the comments. I took these questions inside the Impact Lounge engagement group on Facebook. I've had people ask me, how do I get involved with the Impact Lounge engagement group on Facebook? You search the Impact Lounge engagement group on Facebook. There are some questions you got to answer. They're they're a little outdated, like talking about we own the night and shit. But as long as you're making some kind of attempt, I know you're for real, for real. So let us get into these. I've got a handful of solid questions. Uh, first one: Now that you're on speaking terms with the company again, <laughs> do you know if Ace and Bay are officially done with Bullet Club? So creative wise, I'm never going to know what's going on. I don't have that kind of in. The in that I have is that I can clear up rumors. I have multiple people I can talk to. So it's not just just, you know, one person. I have multiple people um wrestlers and non-wrestlers that I can speak to. Um and I can clear up I I can clear up rumors and I plan on doing a better job of clearing up rumors. Than I have because I I do think I have the uh, responsibility as a podcaster covering covering this company with ninety nine percent of my content uh, to to be the anti dirt sheet and those those rumors that come out whether positive or negative um, I th I think I do owe it to you the subscribers to get to the bottom of stuff a little bit more so I do plan on doing that and I have said that much. Um, I, I've been given the green light to clarify stuff with them. And I said, I will take them up on that. So, um, that is, that is like the extent of, of my connections there. It is not, um, I cannot tell you, I can, I mean, I could probably tell you like people coming and going, not, not coming, but going like if someone's leaving, um, there are things there, there is some news that I received that I can't repeat, but I'll. I will keep it in the back of my mind when I'm delivering information so I can do my part to avoid false information from getting out there. Uh, but from a creative standpoint, I cannot, I, I could not tell you anything. I, I could try to ask. I would not get a response. I can tell you that much. I can guarantee you that much. And I've been told uh, that my opinion is very much taken into consideration uh, because I guess the company does like to hear the good and the bad. So, you know, like I posted a screenshot of, of this, uh, you know, clown in the comments, Greg Blanton, saying, you know, TNA doesn't care what, about you, what you have to say. Like, they don't care about me, no, but um, what I say is it does not fall on deaf ears by any stretch of the imagination. I hate to break it to you. Next one, what is your main event for Slammiversary? How do you book the storyline from then to BFG? So... I am a fan. I am a podcaster, not in the industry, never been in the industry. Doesn't mean that I can't state an opinion to you guys as a fan. And I say that every so once in a while because I, I want to make it clear. Like, I'm no expert. I have a very strong opinion on things, uh, but I'm no expert. I'm definitely no booker. But uh, what I personally would do is what I thought they should have done at Rebellion. And I would I would make the the uh, main event a slam reversary. I actually wouldn't put the title on the line. I would do a um, uh, what the hell's the match called? Lethal lockdown. My bad. I would do a lethal lockdown with the system. Uh, I would have Mike Santana on the other side. I would have um, probably throw the Nemeth brothers on the other side if if Nick is even cleared. And um, I guess it would have to be three on three, right? 
I'm thinking if you try to do four on four, if you try to intergender it up, um, I'm sure there's a way that you could do that. But I would have some kind of gang warfare type of match, some kind of war game, something or other type of match to be your main event of Slam Reversary. The reason that I say Lethal Lockdown is because what I thought Rebellion was missing was a piece of TNA. Like Hard to Kill was the rebrand, and what Rebellion was missing was the next step in that rebrand. Like They just did a regular Impact Wrestling pay-per-view rather than, okay, we're going to bring back lethal lockdown uh we're gonna bring back i'm trying to think what other what other fucking match because they have brought back a couple in the past like the reverse battle royal and shit even though it's a, a, a joke match um they brought back king of the mountain before queen of the mountain whatever it was actually king of the mountain probably would have been a good one to bring back but i thought that's what was re- missing from rebellion with slammiversary i can't i don't think you can do um impact wrestling pay-per-view I think it's got to grab something from the past of TNA. And because the lethal lockdown concept hasn't been used in a very, very long time, I think it's, uh, I think it would be perfect. And I think from there, I would set up Mike Santana for the main event of Bound for Glory. The X factor in this is Josh Alexander. He won that number one contenders match that I have gone on record said I didn't think was necessary. I thought it was, I, I mean, it was him and Frankie Kazarian in their normal clothes fighting in an impromptu match. I That still just makes no sense to me. I would still keep Josh out of the title picture. Josh, um, they've, done, they've done a pretty good job with him this year. I know he's kind of out of pocket at the moment. They've done a good job, but he's really at a point that he just has to spend a good year of character development. I don't know that he ever will have a character character, but you know, enough to to work on charisma, work on promos, um, because as I've said before, all of his feuds since he joined the company have been re- revolved around a title or have been a revolved around uh, being the best wrestler in the world, the best tag team in the world. It's just been really the same old, same old with him. I would have really, really kept him out of the title picture. Um, you you probably could have factor you could probably factor him into my concept of lethal lockdown. You just have to find a fourth member for the system, I guess. But I, I don't, I can't imagine that'd be too difficult. Um, but I really would have kept him out, and I would say some kind of match where Moose does not have to defend the title of Slam Reversary, but it's also a draw. And then uh, for Bound for Glory, I would do Mike Santana and Moose. I don't know if I would put the title on Mike, but. Um, I just wouldn't have Josh wrestle for the title until 2025 personally. Uh, and in the same concept of doing that lethal lockdown, I would get the ne- Nemeth brothers wrestling the system for the tag team titles at bound for glory. I think they're probably going to try to do that at slam anniversary. Again, I don't know Nick's health status or I guess it's not a health status. He was written off TV, but I, I don't know what his contractual over ob- obligations are elsewhere like New japan or whatever i don't really pay attention to that stuff my gut tells me they would probably try to do the nemeth brothers at slam anniversary i would i would push that off to bound for glory as well i would those two marquee matches i would just combine into one kind of main event at slam anniversary and then then build off it up to bound for glory if i was marketing uh, what would be your strategy for getting butts and seats would you consider cross promotion with the likes of NWA or MLW as part of said strategy? So if I was promoting, if I was marketing, um, I don't have experience with like my experience has always been kind of a social media. I don't really have it with, Hey, let's, let's build a crowd. So, so to speak. Um, so maybe they do this. I don't think they do. I would have a stronger presence in okay whatever city they're doing just say it's somewhere in kentucky i would have a stronger presence a month out uh, as far as what are the independent shows in the area i would i would be very involved in those independent shows sending a lot of my top talent uh sending representatives there to maybe hand out maybe, maybe not to hand out free tickets but um to do contests, to do some sort of giveaways for seats, 
I, I wouldn't try to sell the tickets necessarily, but I would promote very hard at these independent shows because it's not the independent shows are more popular than TNA. They draw better a lot of the time. It's more because they there's just a it's a completely different business model. It's one match a month. I mean, excuse me, one show a month, and they're throwing everything at this show. You know, it just it's almost like doing a monthly pay per view. It's very very different. But I, I would take better ex, uh, advantage of local independent promotions. I think Jeff Jarrett was trying to do that when he was around towards the end. Not towards the end, but, but I mean his second time around. I think he was trying to get more involved in doing things like that. But I would do a little bit more. Um, groundwork with local promotions and see how we can just better promote the promote in the area because just putting up signs and I know that's all grassroots marketing that's it doesn't really work as well in today's landscape but I would I would partner a lot harder with uh, local independent promotions and try to find out uh, how they can better promote the shows in advance by doing that. Actually, I shouldn't say I have no experience in my late 20s uh, when I was I was doing live performances with music a lot. Um, I would do a lot of local when I lived in Florida. I lived in Florida at the time, um, and I would do a lot of local, a lot of my own local promotion. But I would really reach out and touch people rather than just rely on social media posts, like broad social media posts. Like you'd be surprised just asking people one on one to their face, like, hey, you know, why don't you come here and support this? You know, you'd be surprised how many people actually follow through and do that rather than just try to use a very, very broad approach. TNA has a pretty solid main event wrestlers on the men's side, which they do. This is the best main event scene they've had in a while. Tag team division is lacking on both sides. So he's talking about the men's and the knockouts, which is also very, very true. Who would you bring in or pair from the current roster? So I got some clarification on this. He was asking who I... You know, who from the roster would I create tag teams out of? One thing I found very interesting looking at the roster, usually there's people who pick up on this stuff. Um, I haven't seen anyone say it. Sheldon Gene is not on here. He's not on the current roster page. They had absolutely no plans for him uh, once Kenny King left. And that that is a sign of a, a, of a deeper issue. I use the example on several of the podcasts talking about the NWA's women's division. With the NWA, they've had some pretty major departures between Camille, Thunder Rosa, Molina. Um, kind of trying to think who else off the top of my head, but they've had some some pretty major departures. Um, you know, Allison Kay was a champion at one point and left. Um, and they always seem to have a backup plan. And, you know, when Kenny King left, it was like, okay, we were wondering oh, what are they can do with Sheldon Gene now because he kind of had a good thing going and there was nothing. There was no backup plan. And we kind of see that within a lot of the departures, whether it's the men or women, we see people leave and it just doesn't seem like there's a, a next man up mentality with the wrestlers. I know that behind the scenes, they have a next man up mentality. You know, when Jer Jeremy Borash left once upon a time and said, okay, next man up. But on the roster, we don't see that. Like the actual wrestling, we, we just haven't really seen that. So I was going to throw Sheldon Jean on this list, but then I looked at the roster. I'm like, he's not even on there. Um, But as far as I, who I would pair up, it's a small roster. You know, relatively speaking, there's not a lot you can do. I would finally pull the trigger though on uh Bupinder and Champagne Singh as a team. They try to do Bupinder as a baby face singles. No wrestling company has ever effectively made a baby face Indian star. You can't count the great Kali because he's a completely different case. And and by the time he was a baby face, he was actually sort of a jobber despite his size. Um and I'm not saying go the traditional Indian route like they got champagne sing away from that but I think at this point pair them together and you can throw Shira in there as well you know but pair these guys together come on um, I don't know how long they want to keep Jack Price and, and Shogun off TV there's really no reason at this point you can't put those guys together as a tag team they've tagged before on the show on BTI but at this point I just don't like why not like what is the difference between 
using them as a team just for the sake of having a team and using the good hands. Like Jack Price is as good as Jason Hotch. You know, um, and I, I think Shogun is more unique than John Schuyler. So why not? I it's weird to me. There's got to be more to it, but I, I, I don't understand um what's going on with that. Other than that, I mean, there's there's really not a lot you can do to to pair people up, unfortunately. From a female standpoint, I would, uh, I, and I've I said this a long time ago when Steph Delander was kind of floating around the first time, I would I would team her up with Savannah Evans. I don't know if Savannah Evans is still on the roster page. It looked like they kind of wrote her off TV, but um, if she is still around, I actually would pair her and Steph Delander because it would be very unique, like a you know an Amazon style of team. I think it could be very unique very interesting but other than that there's not really a whole lot you can you can do with the roster you know i think i think uh, pairing danny luna and uh, jody threat was a good idea you know they definitely got to bring new people in though is kelly killer kelly on this roster page i feel like i didn't see her j k no she is okay um you know, but I would go with the kind of an Amazon tag team like that. I'm sure there's someone better we can put Khan with somewhere on the roster if we really wanted to to figure something out. But they really just need to bring in some fresh, um, a few fresh names. They don't have to be at the top of the card, but they got to bring in a few fresh names because the tag team divisions are are very very in very bad shape. All right, would you go the intergender route with Jordan Grace after this reign is over? Now that she's had a taste of the big stage, do you think she's going to go once her deal is up? As far as intergender, I would say yes. I'm not saying that's a good thing or a bad thing. There's a lot of TNA fans who do not like intergender wrestling. It does not bother me because if the wrestlers are willing to do it, who am I to say you shouldn't be doing that? And um, I know people don't like the the idea of men beating on women, but I mean, is it if they're trained fighters? Is it much different than if it's a karate tournament? And I know they don't really do this, but I mean, if men were fighting the women, I, I don't know. Like they're trained fighters, so it, it's one thing if the match is uh, Big Con versus Zia Brookside. Or it's Big Con versus um, Gia Miller, you know. I I would probably have an an issue like that, but or an issue with that. But Jordan Grace clearly can wrestle the dudes. I don't think it's that big of a deal personally. Will she go to WWE? Fuck yes, she was going to. She's a great ambassador for this company. She's pretty much irreplaceable. Like you can't find Jordan Grace elsewhere. You just can't. Closest thing is Tessa Blanchard, and I don't know if they're going to do that. They might have to. Shit. Jordan Grace is 100% going to go there when, when her contract is up. I don't remember TNA lending anyone talent since they lent uh, W. Morrissey over to AEW, and he bounced immediately. You give people that te- that taste, you know, it's going to happen. They had Jordan Grace in the Rumble. She wasn't on like Raw. They had her in the Royal Rumble. She's 100% going to go there when this contract is up. So I, I'm not even, I'm not even, there's no one that can, can, can convince me otherwise. Like she, as I said, she's a great ambassador for the company. She clearly wants to be there. But I mean, look what she's doing now. They're just bringing in random opponents for her. They have nothing, they have nothing planned for her. It's clear. I shouldn't say that, but right now they don't. They're spinning their wheels. It's painfully obvious on TV. I think eventually she is going to wrestle Ash by awfulness, and Ash is going to take the title, and the division is really going to go downhill at that point. We have noticed a trend in their venue location so far. Do you think it's affecting them in regards to ticket sales due to them going back to the same venues within a short period of time? 
here was the the problem with going back to Las Vegas. So I was at both TV tapings, both pay-per-views. I can't tell you how many people around me were not TNA fans. It doesn't mean they were haters. I mean, they were like very casual wrestling fans, wrestling fans learning about the company for the first time or for the first time in a while. So when you run hard to kill, you're going to get the TNA fans and then you're going to get a good portion of those. We will call them casual fans. You run the same venue again a couple months later. You might get the TNA fans, but those casuals, you're going to get half of them. And that's what happened. Or you might get none of them. You might get some new ones. But if if it was a, a, a sellout, if Hard to Kill was a sellout of, of diehard TNA fans from top to bottom, it probably wouldn't be that big of a deal to run two venues in a row. You know? I mean, NXT is always in the same place, right? Impact's, Impact was doing the the Orlando forever and granted those weren't huge crowds, but I mean, it's, it's not, it's not like the end of the world to run the same venue twice in a row, but what they were trying to do here is, Oh, it worked the first time. Let's do it again. But the problem is you didn't have Scott Demore. Like you cut off the head of the snake, uh, the guy who was the driving force, but behind all this, you came with a, a faceless management team. You didn't have, you know, the Okadas and Ospreys that you were promoting for television. You just put on a regular pay-per-view. So those casual people aren't probably aren't going to show up for that. You know, so I think it, I, I don't think it was the smartest thing in the world to do that, but it wasn't a failure at the same time. Like it was still a large crowd. It was still an engaged crowd. It was a great show. It was a lot of fun. It's, it's it's not a failure, but I wouldn't I wouldn't do that for that lone reason, like I'm saying. And some of you who have been to shows can will probably agree with me that you're sitting amongst people who who don't necessarily aren't necessarily smart to the product. You know, so uh, I don't think that's going to be a, a thing going forward. I don't think they're going to back to back. Uh, I th- I think it was just. They had so much success and some people at the top who thought they knew what they were doing said, let's do it again. Actually, I tell you guys what, instead of making an assumption, I'm going to find out why they ran the same venue twice in a row. I'm going to hopefully I can get an answer that I can share. But I'm going to try to find out that for you guys. So we're that's been a big talking point. Why is Rebellion and Hard to Kill? Why is back-to-back pay-per-views in the same place? We're going to find out. All I can do is speculate. But to me, it was just a faceless management team saying, hey, this worked before. Let's do it again. It's going to work again. We got the biggest numbers we've had. And, you know, all this time, let's do it again because we're going to get the same results. That That's how I feel. <laughs> that's how I feel it, it, it went down. Uh, but I, I'll definitely look into that. Uh, if I had to guess how many Spitfire t-shirts have sold, <laughs> their t-shirt is not very good. So I um I don't know. I guess anyone that's a fan of them would probably still buy it. It's not something that jumps out to me. I do think overall their merch, I think they do need to step it up. The the shirts are very they're not bad, but they're they're standard. The standard like wrestling t-shirts. I would do a better job of tapping into AEW was great about this when AEW was good, not so much now. But I would do a very I would do a better job of tapping into things that are organically happening on TV and then, then turning that into into merchandise. Like especially with Joe Hendry, I think you could do that, but they're not necessarily doing that. But that is going to do it for this mailbag episode. I will make sure to get back on here. Uh, do another one soon, and I am going to find out what the reasoning was or the thinking behind uh, running the Palms twice in a row. It worked for me because I live out there. I live out here. You know, th- it was nothing for me to to drive, you know, 12, 15 minutes over there. But um, I would love to know what the thinking was. And I'll get back to you on that. I'm your boy, BQ, and I'm out. Peace.